In this video, we're going to focus on the dependent variable and the independent variable. So first, what is the difference between the dependent variable and the independent variable? What you need to know is that the independent variable is associated with the x-axis. The dependent variable is associated with the y-axis or the y variable. y depends on x, so the dependent variable depends on the independent variable. The independent variable is associated with the experimental group. The experimental group is set up as the control group, but it differs from the control group in one factor. The control group is simply used as a comparison. But just make sure you know that the dependent variable is associated with the y-axis and the independent variable is associated with x. So now how can we apply this information? How can we use it in the problem? Let's try this problem. An experiment was designed to measure the net force acted on objects with different masses. Plot the data shown below on a graph. So here we have a physics related problem. What we need to determine is which one is the dependent variable and which one is the independent variable. Keep in mind the dependent variable depends on the independent variable. So does the force depend upon the mass or does the mass depend on the force in this particular example? Notice that we can select objects with different masses. So we can vary the mass. That's something that we have control over. So therefore, this is the independent variable, which is associated with x. The quantity that we're measuring, that's the dependent variable. We want to see how the force depends on the mass. So therefore, force, we should put that on the y-axis. And we should plot the mass on the x-axis. So we're going to adjust these values by 10 on the x-axis and on the y-axis. Each mark will represent 20. So this is about 100. So the first point is at 1020 approximately, which is over here. Then we have another point at around 20, very close to 40. And then 30, 60, 40, 80. And finally, 50, 100. So we have a straight line. Let's do that again. Now, what kind of relationship do we see between the force and the mass? Is it linear, quadratic, inverse? What type of relationship do we have here? So we have a linear relationship since we have a straight line. And so this is a proportional or a direct relationship. We could say that the force varies directly or proportionally with the mass. So as the mass increases, the force increases. Now, what is the slope of the line? Notice that the mass increases by 10 and the force increases by 20. The slope is the change in y divided by the change in x. It's rise over run. So the change in force is about 20 newtons, and a change in mass is approximately about 10 kilograms. So we could say the slope is equal to 2. And it turns out that the slope of this graph represents the acceleration of the object, which is approximately 2 meters per second squared. Or you can say 2 newtons per kilogram which is really meters per second squared. Now, if you choose any two points, you should get a slope approximately 2. It may not be exactly 2, but it rounds to 2. Now, you might have seen a slope equation like this. y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. It's the same as the expression that I have here. 
y2 minus y1 represents the change in y, x2 minus x1 represents the change in x. So that is it for this question, and let's move on to our next example. Here's another problem. Feel free to pause the video and see if you can work out this problem as well, and then unpause it to check the solutions. So an experiment was set up in such a way to measure the pressure of a gas at different volumes. Plot the data shown below and determine the relationship between pressure and volume. So which one is the dependent variable and which one is the independent variable? Is volume the dependent variable or the independent variable? Notice that we want to measure the pressure. The quantity that you want to measure is typically the dependent variable. So pressure is associated with the y variable. Now, we want to measure the pressure at different volumes. That means that we can adjust the volume. We can put the gas in any container we want. We can put it in a 1 liter container, a 2 liter container. We can control the volume of the container. The quantity that you can manipulate or control that is the independent variable, that's x. So you can adjust the volume to whatever value you want and you want to measure the pressure at that volume. So pressure is going to be on the y-axis and volume is going to be on the x-axis. So on the y-axis, I'm going to go by 2, so this is going to be 10 atm. And on the x-axis, I'm going to go by 1, so this is going to be 5 liters. So the first point is at 1, 8, which is somewhere over here. The next point is 2, 4, or 4.1. And then it's 3 and 2.7. And then we have another point, 4, 2. And then 5, 1.6. So we have a graph that is decreasing over time. So what kind of relationship do we have? Whenever you have a graph that looks like this, this is an inverse relationship. So as volume increases, pressure decreases. So we have an inverse relationship graph. And that's all we can do for this particular problem. Here's another problem that you can try. Another experiment was designed in such a way to measure the total distance traveled by an object under constant acceleration with different time periods. Plot the data and determine the relationship between distance and time. So what's the first thing that we need to do? We need to determine which one is the dependent variable and which one is the independent variable. So what do we want to measure? So in this experiment, we wish to measure the total distance, which is the independent variable. No, I take that back. That is not the independent variable. That's the dependent variable. So that's y. The quantity that you want to measure, it's always the dependent variable, and you should put that on the y-axis. The quantity that you can adjust or that you control, that is the independent variable, and so that has to go on the x-axis. And notice that we measure the distance traveled by the object at different time periods. We can measure it in 3 seconds, we can measure it in 10 seconds, we can control the time that we choose to measure the distance. Now that we've identified the dependent and the independent variable, we know where to put the distance and where to put the time. So the distance is going to be on the y-axis and the time 
is on the x-axis. Typically, time is usually the independent variable. I don't think I've ever seen time on the y-axis. Time is usually on the x-axis. On the x-axis, we're going to go by 1 until we reach 5. And on the y-axis, let's go by 20s. 20, 40, 60, 80, 100, and 120. So the first point that we have is 1, 5, which is probably somewhere close to the x-axis. And then it's 2, approximately 20. And then 3, it's about 45. And then at 4, it's up to 80. And then at 5, it's about 125. So notice that this graph, it's increasing at an increasing rate. So how would you describe the relationship of this graph? So what we have here is a quadratic relationship or a parabolic relationship. The relationship between distance and time is associated with this equation. So if an object accelerates from rest, here's the equation that you need. So let's say if we plug in 5 for the distance and the time is 1. If you multiply both sides by 2, you'll see the acceleration is approximately 10. 5 times 2 is 10. Now, if we were to choose a different point, let's say if we were to use the last point, 125. So using the same equation, Let's round 124.8 to 125 for the distance, and t is 5. So 5 squared is 25. If we divide both sides by 25, 125 divided by 25 is 5. So we have 5 is equal to 1 half a. And then if you multiply both sides by 2, you'll see that a is approximately 10. Now the slope of a distance time graph will give you the speed. For a displacement time graph, the slope represents the velocity. And the slope of a velocity time graph is the acceleration. But the relationship between distance and time, you can see that d is proportional to t squared. So that's why we could say it's quadratic, because the t is squared. So that is it for this video. Thanks for watching and have a great day.